for joining me once again at the lathe. I've been wanting to do a video on scraping for some time now and I finally sorted out how to present that topic. So this time we'll take a look at conventional scraping. Uh, you may not have heard the term conventional before but that's just a word that I use sometimes to differentiate uh, regular old scraping from things like shear scraping and negative rake scraping. So without hesitation let's dive right in. So what exactly is scraping and how does it differ from cutting? Well, if you look at any cutting tool, uh, for instance this gouge, um, there's always going to be two surfaces intersecting. In the case of the gouge, we have the flute and then we have the bevel that we've ground away and that's left us with a sharp edge and that sharp edge severs the fibers. With a scraper, instead of using that sharp edge uh, to sever the fibers, uh, we have a little burr on the edge. It's, it's almost microscopic. Sometimes you can angle the tool just right in the light and you can see it, but you can always feel that little burr on the edge. And instead of using the cutting edge to do the severing, we use that little burr to sever the fibers. So why bother picking up a scraper? Why not just stick with cutting tools the whole time? Well, I'm actually of the opinion that you should try to get as far as you can with cutting tools uh, before going to scrapers because cutting tools they cut much more cleanly, much more efficiently, uh, they very rarely leave tear out. Uh, but there are several situations in which cutting tools just won't do the job. Uh, one thing that scrapers are really good at uh, is that if you've almost got your shape of the profile that you want and you just need to take off a little bit of material, uh, scrapers are very good at being able to make very light, very small cuts. So they're very good for getting your final shape. There are also some woods, most woods will respond well to cutting, um, but there are some woods, uh, from what I've heard, things like uh, dense exotics sometimes don't respond well uh, to cutting, uh, they respond much better to scraping. So that's another case where you might uh, get a scraper instead of a cutting tool. And finally, there's certain situations, especially when uh, cutting end grain, uh, cutting tools can only get you so far because you can't get the cutting tool in the right situation. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking of hollowing end grain. Uh, you can, as we saw in previous videos, uh, you can, to some extent, you can cut against the grain, uh, or you can try to reverse your cut from the center outwards, uh, and that way you're not going cutting against the grain. Another technique, uh, if you know how to do it, it's a kind of an advanced cut, uh, back hollowing, uh, but even that only gets you so far. And at some point when you're doing hollowing, you're going to have to pick up a scraper to finish the job. Now understanding the distinction between uh, using a sharp cutting edge of a cutting tool and using the burr uh, of a scraper is essential to being successful uh, with scraping. Um, with a cutting tool, um, not always necessary, but whenever possible, we want to have one of those one of those two surfaces that is forming the cutting edge, usually the bevel, in contact with the wood, and that's going to give us a lot of control and a nice clean cut. Uh, now with a scraper, we actually want to avoid bevel contact altogether, uh, because if you notice the direction of the cut on the burr, it's completely different if we were trying to do use this as a cutting tool. So. If I was to press too hard or if I was to drop the handle and that bevel started to become in contact with the wood, all of a sudden it doesn't want to be a scraper anymore. It wants to be a cutting tool. And a cutting tool is, in this position is going to have a completely different direction of cut uh, than, it will be, than it would if it was scraping. And that's where a lot of the really bad catches with a scraper come. So we want to avoid the bevel contact and use just the bird to do the work for us. The easiest way uh, to ensure that we don't make bevel contact with a scraper is to always make sure that uh, whatever angle is formed by the, this top surface here and th where the wood is contacting the, cut, the, the burr uh, should always be less than 90 degrees. So that means we generally want the tool to be slightly downhill. Uh, now with outside curves like this, we also want to be at or below center line. If we get too high, even if we're uphill and we get too high, we no, we no longer have that 90 degrees. So on um, an outside curve, uh, at or below center, and the tool is slightly downhill. Now with inside uh, curves, uh, it's the opposite. So we still want the tool to be slightly downhill, but we want to be uh, at or above 
uh, the center line. That'll guarantee that that angle is always less than 90. And with flat surfaces, whether they're inside or outside, doesn't matter. Uh, as long as the tool is slightly downhill, you'll have your less than 90 degrees formed by the top of the scraper and the surface of the wood. Perhaps the second most important thing to understand about scraping as opposed to cutting is that when we're cutting, we very often have the energy that's being absorbed by the cutting edge. Uh, some of it is actually uh, trying to push the tool down, uh, as in leverage, and, but some of, the t some of the energy is actually coming down the tool. And that energy coming down the tool is never a problem because it just basically pushes us off the cut. Scraping on the other, on the other hand, uh, because we always have the tool uh, slightly downhill, um, there's never any energy going down the tool. All the energy being absorbed by the burr is leverage straight down. Uh, so we want to be careful about how much of the burr we engage at once when it comes to scrapers. And I'd say as a general rule of thumb, uh, I try not to engage more than three-eighths of an inch at one time. So we do have a lot of burr here to use and we want to use all of that at some point. But at any one time, maybe three eighths, maybe at most half an inch, uh, do you want engaged at any single time? Because if we engage too much of the burr, we're gonna have a lot of pressure and the wood's gonna to want to push the tool down. Now probably the third most important thing to understand about scraping uh, is that because we have the tool absorbing 100% of the energy as the, as the burr is doing its work, uh, it's very susceptible to vibration. Uh, so if you're about an inch over the tool rest, a quarter inch thick scraper shouldn't give you too much trouble. But you'll find as you get further and further over the tool rest with a scraper, a quarter inch scraper is going to vibrate quite a bit. And so uh, for purposes of just refining your work uh, and getting rid of some tear out, quarter inch thick scrapers are fine because um, you generally have the tool rest pretty close to the work and you can get that job done without any vibration. But as you get further and further over the tool rest, you really need to go with a thicker and thicker scraper. Uh, three eighths will get you a good four inches over the tool rest without any vibration. Um, now that the, the downside is that thick scrapers like this can be really, really expensive, um, but if you have some kind of particular work you're doing over and over again, you need to get in deep. Uh, you might want to consider investing at least one uh, scraper that's really, really thick like that. Now, as far as those bits on using a scraper, that is always keeping the tool slightly downhill, make sure your contact with the work is less than 90, and only using a small portion of the burr at a time, is not very controversial. Pretty much any turner I've talked to or watched in the video uh, it's pretty much an agreement, uh, but when it comes to preparing a scraper, that all changes because it's another one of those situations where ask 10 turners, get 11 answers. Which is kind of interesting because there's only two parameters to consider. There's the bevel angle and there's how do you raise the burr. So the first parameter we can talk about when setting up a scraper is the bevel angle. Uh, I've seen uh, all over the place from 80 degrees all the way to 45, which is close to what this one is. And uh, Now why talk about the bevel angle if the whole point with the scraper is to not rub the bevel, not to have any bevel contact. And that's precisely the first function is that it keeps the bevel away from the burr so that we can make uh, contact with the burr and the burr can do its job without any risk of getting uh, bevel contact. Now with a flat surface like this, it's not going to be that risky. You could probably have a 7 degree bevel angle here and have no risk of contacting that bevel. But as you start to do hollowing, especially if you're doing blind hollowing, you might not be able to see what you're doing so much. And so that extra clearance is a good thing. So as long as you don't go too thin, this is about, this clearance angle is about 40 degrees. Um, if you go any thinner than that, you start to thin out the material too much and you could get vibration. Now, the second function of the bevel is it affects the shape of the burr at the end of the tool. Uh, if you have a narrower bevel angle like this, the burr tends to come out off the tip more. And I found that it slightly uh, leaves a slightly cleaner surface, uh, but the burr doesn't last as long.
um, it's a much more fragile burr. Uh, as opposed to uh, if you have something more like a 70 degree bevel angle, the hook, that little burr, tends to come up more. And it's much better for, uh, it doesn't leave as clean a surface, um, but it's much better uh, for hauling because the burr will last a lot longer. Now, I, I've kind of tried both, and for a lot of times, I find the difference negligible. Um, but if you did have trouble, if you were having trouble getting a good finish and you were using a 70 degree bevel angle, um, you might want to try something narrower, see if that helps get rid of the tear out. Now there's a little bit of a, of a conflict of interest here because uh, we may want to have a narrow, uh, a wide uh, bevel angle because we're doing hollowing. Um, but at the same time, we might want to have the advantage of having a lot of clearance uh, so we don't accidentally uh, come in contact with the bevel. So is there a way that we can get the best of both worlds? And what I've been doing lately, uh, and the reason I have this bevel all the way out to about 40 degrees, uh, that's just for clearance, and that's happened to be, that happens to be where I, my grinder platforms are normally set. So um, the purpose of this bevel here, uh, in this case, is only for clearance. And if you look at the side, or look at the very edge here, you can see I actually have a secondary bevel and that's the one that's actually doing the work. In this case, it's probably about 45 degrees. So I basically grind at 40 degrees first to remove, to remove some of the material here. And I lift the handle just a hair uh, and I'll regrind it just to get the, the micro bevel at the edge that's about 45 degrees. Or I could lift it up even higher and I could get whatever bevel angle I want here. If I'm doing hollowing, I could have a 70 degree secondary micro bevel uh, near the edge and still have all this clearance right there. And also, the advantage of that is you can switch back and forth because there's very little material to, move, to remove to change back to, say, something more like a 45 degree. Now, you'll see some turners will have a pretty strong opinions about which bevel angle is the best for a scraper. Uh, but where opinions really start to diverge uh, is what's the best way to raise a burr uh, on a scraper. Uh, but most methods uh, will at least start on the grinder and so my platform is set to 40 degrees and I'll start by just removing a little bit more of that relief bevel at 40 degrees and then depending on whether I want a 45 degree a burr at a 45 degree angle I might lift, lift up the tool just a little bit off the tool rest and I don't fuss too much over precise angle I think more in terms of uh, narrower is better for uh, uh, for difficult grain or if I'm trying to get a nice finish and uh, a wider angle is better for um, uh, for hollowing. So if I want to do some hollowing I'll lift the, the tool a little bit more and I'll just take a little bit off the edge and that'll give me my 60, 70, 80 degree burr whatever I need. And now you can go right to using this burr. In fact that's what I do most of the time. Um, there are other further preparations you can do and, but I find for the most part, the uh, amount of time it takes um, to do those, it doesn't really buy you anything in the end because generally with this edge, uh, I'm, after this, I'm going to say 150, 180 degree sandpaper. Uh, and as long as there's no real, as long as there's no tear out, um, this will leave, I find, a perfectly suitable su uh, surface to start sanding with. Now, that being said, um, if I'm having trouble, if I have some particularly difficult grain and I, 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 and I continue to get tear out, I'll try any and all other methods uh, to prepare the burr uh, in an attempt to try to get rid of that uh, tear out before I move on to the sanding phase. So one additional preparation that some turners like to do, uh, they'll actually refer to it as taking off the burr. They'll take something like a, a diamond hone, like this one, and they'll rub that, they'll, they'll actually remove the burr from the top. Now, it may feel like you've removed the burr from the top, but what you've actually done is you've pushed a little burr out off the end of the, of the scraping edge. And what this does, a lot of times, if you're trying to get a really, really clean surface and avoid sanding, um, this sometimes works. But I find that sometimes, um, it will actually, if it's certain really tight grain woods, it might actually start to tear out again. So you can always give this a try if you're trying to get a fine, get a really fine uh, surface, but um, be aware that you might actually end up adding problems as well. Now what some turners will do after they've taken off uh, the burr like this, is they'll actually re-raise the burr 
uh, using the diamond hone just by always pushing up and this is actually very similar to using that secondary bevel uh, right off the grinder but instead of making your secondary bevel uh, with the grinder you're simply doing it with a diamond hone and what that'll do is it'll give you a very fine uh, non-jagged very smooth edge which will work really good on some woods made perhaps uh, um, dense exotics uh, but I find that sometimes that uh, extra smooth, that non-jagged edge uh, will actually again start causing some tear out. It's kind of like using a serrated edge when you're using right off the grinder. It's kind of like using a serrated knife on a tomato. It tends to not rip the tomato so much. Uh, and this tends to be more like a regular chef's knife with a nice smooth edge. It really depends on what you're cutting, uh, what kind of results you're going to get out of it. Now yet another preparation is kind of borrowed from woodworking uh, and card scrapers where uh, very often you'll, uh, you'll, you'll draw out the burr similar to what we're doing when we take off the burr with the, uh, with the uh, diamond home and then you use some kind of bar, uh, 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 burnishing rod to push up a burr. Um, but because we use high speed steel uh, in most wood turning tools, your rod's going to have to be made out of carbide. It has to be harder than the material you're trying to turn the burr on. And I, I've tried this a little bit, and some people like to do this, um, but I find uh, for turning tools, it's not really worth the effort uh, of burnishing. I don't get that much benefit out of it uh, compared to how much time it takes me to have to stop and, and, and set up a burnishing tool. Now one last way to prepare the burr, to raise a burr on a turning tool, I learned from Jimmy Clues. Um, he sets the platform up like this and he grinds the uh, scraper upside down. And what that does, it'll produce a very aggressive burr. Uh, probably not good for refining work, but if you want to do some hollowing and you want a really aggressive burr, you can give that a try as well. Now one thing I found that works, that helps, regardless of how you decide to uh, raise the burr on a scraper, is to polish the top edge. Now you don't have to top polish everything, you only need to polish the very edge. And I usually do that with a diamond hone. And if you can't get all the way out to the edge very easily, I even cheat, I raise it up just a hair. Uh, just to make sure the very edge is polished. Now you don't have to do this every time you sharpen the scraper, only when the scraper is new or if you've changed the shape or if you've been using it for a while and it starts to grind back to where there's no more shiny edge anymore, just come back with the diamond hone and get that shiny edge uh, once again. And this improves the surface uh, regardless of how you decide to raise the burr. And it's even if it only improves a little bit, it's so little effort uh, to do that it makes it worth the time. So you can see there's quite a few ways that turners like to raise the burr on their scrapers. And you can probably go out and Google for and find quite a few more. Now, if you're pretty new to scraping, don't be overwhelmed by all these different possibilities. If you're if you're new to scraping, new to turning, uh, I would say just try going straight off the grinder, uh, the way I make my relief bevel, and then lift the handle just a hair uh, to get your secondary bevel to raise the burr, and go from there. And use that burr for a while, see how, how it goes. And uh, if you start to run into trouble with certain kinds of wood, certain kinds of work that you do, try some of the other preparations and see if those solve the problems for you. All right, so we know how to use our scraper and we have our burr turned up. Uh, so it's time to make some shavings. And uh, let's see how scraping reacts in the various grain orientations. And I think I'm gonna start with end grain and spindle work. So I have my tool, flatten a tool rest, but now wait, uh, this is actually uh, a wide cutting angle going into end grain. Can we do that after all the tirades I've made about cutting directly into end grain um, and how dangerous that can be and how you can get a leverage catch? Uh, why would you take a scraper uh, and, and do the same thing? Well, it turns out you can scrape with a wide cutting angle directly into end grain and here's why. Now the wood fibers are kind of like uh, the straw and uh, when I'm cutting end grain and spindle work I'm cutting directly across the fibers. Now with a cutting tool if I could guarantee that I'm only taking off a very small amount of material I might be okay but that's really hard to do uh, with a cutting tool. What tends to happen is the cutting tool will go in a little bit deeper and the deeper it goes, the more resistance you get. It can't get rid of that all of that material, and that's where you get your leverage catch. Now, with a scraper, 
uh, because we're cutting with a really tiny burr, that burr is only going to take off so much material. It can only cut so deep. And because it's only cutting a little bit of material off, that waste always remains flexible and it doesn't cause us any trouble. And that's why we're able to scrape directly into end grain. Now that's really good news when it comes to doing end grain and spindle work. Uh, because even though we have a lot of tricks we can try with uh, a cutting tool is we can try cutting against grain, we can try cutting from the center out, and if you know how to do it, you can even do what's called back hollowing. But those techniques will only get you so far. So if you're doing, say, a goblet that goes much deeper or a box, you're going to have to pick up a scraper at some point uh, to finish the job. Uh, the other thing that helps when you're scraping end grain and spindle work is because all the it, it's pretty a stable, pretty stable operation because the grain is always completely parallel to the, uh, the to the lathe bed, so we're always cutting the fibers directly across uh, the end grain. So it's a, there's a little bit of, of stability and predictability going on there. So, uh, like any time we use a scraper, we're going to have the tool slightly downhill, and we simply engage the burr and the wood. The other thing, nice thing about uh, scraping is that it doesn't matter which direction we go in, we can go either way. Because we're using, because we have a wide cutting angle, uh, there's no issue of the fibers being supported. The fiber being cut is always going to be supported by the one directly above it. So it doesn't matter which direction we go. And when you're hollowing, you can try to hollow laterally like this. Or you can use a square scraper and you can plunge directly in. Really nice to be able to cut directly into end grain with a scraper. Now what about scraping side grain and spindle work? Now, uh, whereas cutting end grain and spindle work is probably the most useful place uh, to use a scraper. Uh, cutting side grain and spindle work is probably the, the least useful. Usually you can get pretty results with cutting tools uh, directly. Um, and uh, there are also sometimes some problems when you're trying to scrape a side grain and spindle work. Be again, because the fibers are always exactly parallel to the lathe bed, uh, sometimes what can happen is that burr can get underneath the fibers and start tearing them away. Uh, so very often you won't be able to improve the surface that much with scraping. Although sometimes if you have some tricky grain, uh, scraping into side grain uh, might be the answer. You can see that surface is not as nice as, uh, as with cutting tools. Uh, the other thing is I find usually if I'm trying to improve the surface in uh, long grain and spindle work, a peeling cut with a skew does a much better job. Uh, than scraping. Now there are the sides of beads and stuff. Now technically that's that's end grain just like it was here and so this would respond well uh, to scraping. So if you're trying to improve the valleys uh, of your beads and coves you could certainly try to do some scraping there. Uh, the trick is that you don't want to come in um, directly you don't want to come directly in this way because you remember you have to keep the surface, top surface of the uh, scraper at 90 degrees with the work and if I come in sideways I'm not doing that so I have to find a way to maneuver the tool rest uh, in another, another, another direction so I can come in and make sure I'm having less than 90 degrees. And here you sometimes can improve. Maybe you can't get that uh, the shape of your uh, cove just right or your bead just right and you can come in here with a scraper. And you, that, that works to some extent, but you might want to hold off. You can try this, um, but you might want to hold off because when we get to doing a negative rake scraping uh, or a, a shear scraping, a lot of times that's a much better option for in here. But you can, you can use a conventional scraper to clean up the uh, end grain on your beads and coves. Now what about side grain in face work? Uh, now you might think just like side grain and spindle work, it doesn't work very well, but it actually works really well in side grain and face work. And the reason has to do with the grain orientation. Um, unlike uh, spindle in spindle work where we're always hitting the uh, fibers exactly parallel, that only happens for a brief moment. 
when you're doing uh, side grain and face work. Most of the time, we're shearing across the fiber at an angle, and only when we get to that one spot uh, directly, when, when the grain is exactly parallel to the, across the blade bed, do we actually go across the fibers exactly parallel, and that's only for a brief moment. So most of the time, we spend shearing across the fibers, and that leaves a really, really nice finish. Now it works on a, uh, on a surface like this, say this is the bottom of a platter, um, but also the bottom of a bowl is also uh, a side grain. So if you have a bowl that's really deep and you can't get a gouge to the bottom or you have an undercut rim that keeps you from getting the gouge in a position where you can rub the bevel, you can use a scraper to finish the bottom of the bowl. And just like any scraping, we can go in any direction. We can go uh, uh, into, uh, from outside in or inside out. It doesn't really matter because we have a wide cutting angle. And again, the fiber is always supported directly by the one just above it. And you can see, even in this curly maple, which is often uh, troublesome when it comes to trying to get rid of tear out, it left a really, really nice surface. You could probably start sanding this with 220, 320 easily. So what about end grain and face work? Can we scrape directly into end grain and face work? Well, this is kind of a gray area. Uh, it gets tricky be again because of the grain orientation changing uh, as it spins around. Um, when the grain is uh, uh, in this orientation, exactly perpendicular to the cutting edge, that's not a problem. Um, uh, as I come around uh, and I start slicing the fibers at 45, still not a problem. And when I get to here, when I'm exactly perpendicular, it's just like end grain in spindle work, that's not a problem. The problem happens when I start to come directly in, uh, head on into the fibers and I can start experience quite a bit of resistance there. Now some turners do, uh, will uh, scrape directly into end grain and face work. Uh, if you're gonna do it though, uh, make sure that you're really close to the tool rest and don't get the tool over any further uh, than necessary and make sure you're very light to the touch. Um, but I generally don't do that um, because as we'll see when we get to doing uh, uh, shear scraping and negative ray scraping, those are much better options for uh, scraping directly into end grain and face work. There are also, there's also the issue of in between here when we're transitioning from face work to end grain. I would say as you're getting to about 45 degrees, as you come around from, from side grain into end grain, you can go to about the 45 degree mark, uh, 45 degree uh, angle, because you're still slicing across the fibers somewhat and doesn't end up being too much trouble. So basically, you can scrape. on side grain and come around until you're about 45 degrees and you'll be okay. But I usually stop right about there. I won't, I won't, uh, I won't conventionally scrape any further into end grain. Okay, so that's my primer on scraping or as I sometimes call conventional scraping to distinguish it from other kinds of scraping. Uh, we still, I'm hoping to cover it very soon uh, two other kinds of scraping. One is uh, negative rake scraping and the other is shear scraping. Now one last bit of advice regarding scrapers as you look through the catalogs or at the store, you'll notice that there's some standard sizes and shapes uh, that they come in and those are usually a, good, a pretty good place to start. But as you start getting in more into a, say a particular kind of work, uh, don't hesitate to change the shape of your scrapers to fit your needs. Um, I have this one scraper, for instance, where I've scraped both sides, so I have a 90 degree corner, and then it radiuses off just slightly. And I use this for getting into the bottom of uh, end grain uh, boxes uh, to get a nice square corner at the bottom. As well, you can make scrapers out of almost any kind of high-speed steel that you can get your hands on. Uh, I buy a lot of uh, bits from the machining industry uh, from, N from a website called Enco, and I'll very often fashion my own scrapers like this half-inch one that I use to get into undercut rims. So that's what I have for you this time. So get out in the shop, try to do some scraping, and see what it can do for you.